All right, we've got one more minute. All right, it uh, looks like we still have some people coming in. So we'll give people a couple of min minutes. Um, anyway, welcome everyone. Welcome back um, to the second part of our fourth annual Critical Access Hospital Virtual Conference, Region D. Um, thank you for coming back or welcome if you haven't been with us before. Um, and I will turn things over to my colleague, Opal Greenway, um, and our guest, Carl Selvig, the CEO of Black River Memorial Hospital. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks everyone for joining us today. So before we get started, I'm gonna take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we, we, you guys will all be muted until, um, unless we specifically take you off mute. So if you have questions or comments, please go ahead and use the chat function or the question and answer function that, that um, is part of Zoom. We will do our best, um, given the time, to address any questions as they pop up and monitor the chat. However, if there are any that we miss, we will make sure that we send you guys responses via email. Um, this session is being recorded, just like yesterday's, and those slides and the recordings are going to be sent to all who registered uh, following the webinar. So, and please keep that in mind that with the session being recorded, um, that you have to accept that for uh, to be able to continue within the session. After we get through the whole presentation, there will be a short survey that will follow the conference session and your feedback, if you will fill that out, that is really helpful to us. It's help, how, part of how we pick our topics for next year. Um, and we, you know, we want to make sure that given that this is our first year, fourth year of doing it and it has grown each and every year that we want to make sure we're constantly giving you guys exactly what you guys need. So um, a few things about Stroudwater for those of you who are relatively new to us. We've been around now for next year will be our 40th anniversary as an organization. We have been focusing specifically on rural since, um, well, at least for the past 20 years. Um, and as you can see, we have done work in all 50 states. This is just a map of our clients since 2017. So good geographic spread, especially where for those of you who are here from Region D, we have been very busy in your region um, over the years and spending a lot of time um, getting to know all of you and especially those of you who are on our frontier states, welcome um, as well. And then also for those of you who are not, uh, might be familiar with Stroudwater Capital Partners, that is our uh, division within the firm that helps with capital financing for rural hospitals and especially getting them partnered with USDA loans. So we just launched that division of the organization back in 2020. And since then, we have 17 of you uh, that have been able to secure USDA and other financing for your different capital projects. So happy to be serving you through Stroudwater uh, Capital Partners. Stroudwater, we are a provider-focused advisory for firm, really working on strategic and operational advisory um, in the rural space, whether your needs are around performance improvement, cost reporting, financial planning. I lead our physician advisory team, which I will be talking about some fun physician and provider work I've been doing with Carl for, I think, since 2022. Carl and I have been working together at his current organization, but have been working together pre that. We also have a clinic and operations team, as well as population health strategies, capital planning, mergers, affiliations, and partnerships, and one of the leading revenue cycle solution organizations um, that really focuses on all the technical aspects of getting paid for all the one, wonderful work you guys do in rural. So, that being said, let's jump into our topic for today's session. So today we are really going to be talking about provider compensation and actually leading an organization through compensation changes. Before I get into things with Carl, I want to give you guys a bit of a background as to why does this topic even matter, right? Other than we know we need to pay our providers, what has been going on in the market that has really been driving this conversation and has led to things such as we partnered with NRHA and NOSOR for the second year in a row to provide the Rural Provider Compensation Survey that will be published in full in July, but some of you got a preview of it um, if you have attended some of the other sessions. 
So, you know, what's driving that conversation? I'm going to give you a little bit of background of the work that Carl and I had been doing together here, specifically at Black River Memorial Hospital. And then really looking forward to having a conversation with Carl and having you, him tell you guys a lot about the, his leader, how he has approached this as a leader of his organization, his experience, and really the challenges and innovations, innovative solutions, and also the cultural leadership that he's been able to develop at his organization. So what has been driving this conversation with regards to provider contracts? Well, one, they're expensive, right? Provider remuneration is our single largest expense in a hospital, um, you know, it is, and it has been going up substantially over the years, but it is an area that is very heavily regulated. I have to say, in my experience of working in rural and being at Stroudwater for the past decade, it's not something that people understand how heavily regulated it is. And it's causing some of our rural organizations to kind of slip into practices that they have no idea that could put them at serious compliance risk. On top of that, things have been changing. Um, the funds aren't there anymore to be able to pay some big fat provider contracts that we've had in the past. And so organizations are in that kind of financial state where they need to reevaluate exactly what is their provider spend, what is their ROI for some of these different positions, and how can we make sure that compensation that we have is actually aligned with what we our organization needs to do in order to be able to not only survive, but eventually thrive. So the reformed lawyer in me would not be able to help herself if I didn't go over the compliance aspect of this and saying, all right, there's laws, right, that actually rule this. And the two primary laws that people hear about are the Stark Law and the Anti-Kickback Statute, all right? Um, this and Stark Law is a civil law, basically, that says you're sub not supposed to be, you, it prohibits you from paying specifically physicians from referring any sort of designated health service unless you actually meet a specific exception. And that exception is if you're paying within fair market value. The Stark Law is important to know because it's a strict liability statute. And so this is where a lot of our rural hospitals are having some issues because it doesn't matter how good intentioned you are. If you are paying outside of fair market value with your providers and you don't dot every I and cross every T, you are presumed liable and that you have committed basically Medicare fraud under the False Claims Act. Right. Not not really fun to be like, wait a minute, I was trying to do the right thing. My that, you know, this I wasn't dotted and this T wasn't crossed. And now I find out that I've committed Medicare fraud. On top of that, there is the anti-kickback statute, which is the criminal law that will make sure you, you look lovely in orange or gray or whatever is the color of choice at your at your correctional facility if you violate the anti-kickback statute and actually can what is considered Medicare fraud by doing that. On top of that, in rural most of our clients are not-for-profit organizations. So private inurement laws also take place that say that basically compensation is, you know, fair for the position that, it, um, that you are paying this person for. And that if you don't do that, while you may not have financial penalties of having to pay triplicate damages for every single Medicare bill that was sent out underneath that person, you may not end up in orange you may lose your not-for-profit status, which would be very difficult for a lot of our organizations if they weren't, if they were not in a not-for-profit status. So really significant consequences. And when I say significant consequences, the DOJ last year was able to get $2.6 billion in settlements for enforcing these laws. And 1.8 billion of them specifically came from provider organizations. So you think about this, this is a money-making industry to enforce these laws. Uh, for, you know, for these organizations. And it was back in 2017, that was the first American Health Lawyer Association conference that I was at, that the OIG was there and said specifically, rural, you're next. We got, we did our big, um, we've gone after a lot of the big organizations. We know that HCA, um, which is one of the largest hospital for, for-profit hospital organizations in the country had been hit. Community Health Networks got hit with the, one of the um, a record-breaking um, suit this past year in settlement. Back in 2017, they said, rural, we are paying attention. Now, people thought maybe that's not really true because we haven't seen it. You have to keep in mind that com these compliance investigations and eventually ending up in sort of judgments, these are a long process. Some of these take three to even six years of investigation 
And those investigations are highly, highly disruptive to your organizations, by the way. These audits, they will they will tie up your CEO forever, and especially the CFO, if you end up ever getting investigated for one of these things. So I'm one of those people, and it's not just because I'm a lawyer, but as far as dot your I's, cross your T's, because you do not want to waste your time with this. Um, on top of that, the technical violations are a really big deal, right? So it's, the cases that I have on here, these are all people who intended to do the right thing, right? And they, all the intent in the world, and they still got hit with penalties. You know, a small hospital in West Virginia got hit by $1.5 million. A hospital about an hour away from me in Tennessee got hit by four, with $4.1 million. So, you know, and for a critical access hospital, a million dollar settlement is going to hurt you significantly. I was not able to get the headline, but I was talking to a CEO. She's a new CEO of a hospital in Texas. A critical access hospital got hit with a $5 million penalty that she is dealing with the cleanup. They have five years to pay it off. So she has to come up with, you know, a um, half a million dollars each year just to pay these penalties. And part of it is, like I said, this is this makes a good amount of money. The DOJ recovers basically for every dollar they spend on this, they're able to recover four dollars and 30 cents. So you think about it, that's a significant positive ROI for the Department of Justice to go after all of these different situations where they think, hey, the compensation just doesn't seem right for the services provided. Now, how do you know? And um, the other piece that I have to say is really important is when you're negotiating your contracts with your providers, a lot of times the provider, like, you know, you need to come in and explain the compliance aspect to them. But the providers sometimes think that it just really applies to the hospital. They don't understand that the provider themselves, the physician, is actually liable as well. So I like to include this specific, the specifics of this case. So there were three Michigan hospitals that back in March were hit with $69 million in, pen in penalties, right? That's that's actually what they settled for. The original, um, the original suit was for substantially more, but they were able to settle for $69 million. They were reviewing compensation that had been paid over a decade. Now, what what was the problem? They had a medical they had a few medical directorship agreements between the hospitals that they said, "Hey, this doesn't comply with Stark law." The medical directorship was not within fair market value, and in one of these hospitals, it was actually they basically had a couple of medical directors within the same specialty that they're like, "These are overlapping responsibilities. How are you paying multiple providers for the same services as being a medical director?" You know that that's you're not a large if you're not a large system where it might make sense to have you know potentially an orthopedic director of sports medicine and then a separate one that's working over in spine we don't have that at our critical access hospitals why would you have multiple medical director agreements I've seen it I have been in organizations where I find out hey it's a critical access hospital and one of the first things I noticed they had three family medicine medical directors. That's not, I can tell you right now, I hope they're never investigated if they haven't fixed that by now, because that's going to be highly problematic. And it's going to be a technical violation. It is a per se on the face of it. You're in trouble. Um, they had physician employment agreements that they said were not within fair market value and did not satisfy. Keep in mind, you have to satisfy the exception. It's not a matter of you have to show proactively that this was within fair market value. There was also an office space rental agreement arrangement which I was recently with a hospital that was um, in the mid-Atlantic states where their um, office space rental agreement, they really didn't have, it was like a one-page document of just saying, this doctor will use our space one day a week with no other provisions whatsoever in the contract. And they weren't charging the physician for it. Hmm, problematic. Um, physician, And then they had this physician-owned investment entity that they basically used to purchase medical equipment for the hospital. So all of these things added up together, $69 million in penalties across the three hospitals. The two physicians that were primarily involved, they personally have to pay back $750,000 of this. So when people come up to you and say, you know, wait, this is the hospital. It's your job to figure it out, right? When Carl was put on the spot, which we'll talk about in a little bit of saying, okay, well, Carl, figure out how to pay me what I need to make to, in order to work here. You know, when you, you want to put this in front of them to say, listen, as a CEO, I'm looking out for you as well. I'm not just looking out for my organization. 
I don't want you to be in a position where you're going to have to substantially pay back some of this compensation that you've received. So how do we stay in compliance with this? What is this fair market value thing that this you know lawyer keeps telling me about that I need to do? Now, fair market value is basically, are we paying um, market level compensation for the commensurate services, right? So what are the, what's the totality of the services that the provider is giving? That's going to be based on their specialty or subspecialty. Are they family med? Are they family med with OB, right? In rural, what family med with OB, that might be our entire obstetric care that we have in our organization. We might have family med docs who are doing our C-sections, so what are their duties and responsibilities? Are they, am I having a primary care provider who's also coming in and doing hospital rounding before clinic every day and after clinic every day? You know, um, what does my community need? Am I starting a new behavioral health program um, that I need to be able to get in psychiatry for or telepsych and making sure that that, what, you know, how do I pay for that? Do I have an abnormally long wait times for to do a new patient visit for, um, a primary care provider, is it taking them, hey, they're completely full and they're already seeing 24 patients a day. And so I can't get anybody into them until, you know, for four months, we really need to recruit another primary care provider. Um, some of our states might have a very specific high disease incidence rate. You know, we have a few of states that we work with that have abnormally high COPD. They need to have access to pulmonology in a way that maybe you wouldn't necessarily see at a critical access hospital. Has the position been open for an incredibly long time? And I want to qualify that because it feels like in rural, it's always taking us forever to recruit. And so it's a matter of, is it taking us a disproportionate amount of time to recruit? During the pandemic, to recruit for a primary care physi um, physician went from 260 days to 366 days for our national average of how long it took to recruit. So when you say it takes a long time to recruit, three months is not a long time to recruit. It feels like that when we don't have a provider that we desperately need, any amount of time feels really difficult to recruit, but it needs to be abnormally outside of what is the considered, you know, the average bounds currently for time to recruit. What is their training experience and experience? An ED provider with rural experience who doesn't have to do a bunch of transfers because they have that ability and they have seven years of experience is worth a lot more to me than a new grad that's only did their education in an urban hospital and had full access to every specialty to be able to refer work to, right? To go and have those consults. So you have to take into consideration the individual that you are recruiting for this. How are you paying them, right? Some people, as we'll talk about with Carl, they might have things that are important to them that you wouldn't expect, such as lunch at the hospital available to them whenever they want it, right? Being able to have access to food. Are they entirely guaranteed compensation? Do they have to have, um, you know, do they have productivity? Do they have quality? So how much compensation is guaranteed versus at risk? And then I say benchmark comparison. So MGMA is currently the largest survey out there. I will say our, go ahead and put in a plug for those of you who have, thank you for participating in the NRHA Stroud Water No Soar Rural Provider Compensation Survey, because we actually have more respondents and more rural providers reflected in that survey that now can be used reorganizations. But I emphasize the benchmark comparison because guess what? That's what the OIG uses, right? And trying to figure out whether or not to do enforcement of looking at compensation they're lawyers. They barely, like they're basically taught, they don't know what a work RVU is. They know it's a unit of measurement that is comes from CMS. And so therefore it's going to be universal across every organization. Not everybody has a rural health clinic so that they can't use RHC visits. They can't use, you know, other, other things to say, what are we going to benchmark to say? Is it commensurate services? So, and actually talking to, you know, lawyers who used to do the, do the enforcement, they are taught here, here's a survey, national survey, MGMA or Sullivan Cotter or one of them that is out there. And it says median compensation is this, median um, productivity based on work RVUs is this. Okay, are those things in line? If they are, we're going to assume it's fair market value. However, if they're not in line, if you're saying this person's level of services is benchmarking at the 30th percentile and you're paying them the 70th percentile of, of this same survey, why is that? That's suspicious to us. That's probably outside of fair market value. We should go and investigate that. 
right? It is not mean it is outside of fair market value, but those benchmark comparisons, that's what the lawyers have to go off of. They're not in healthcare. They're not in your hospitals. They don't know that it took you three years to be able to even get this doctor in and that you guys have had serious out migration issues. And so people are not getting access to care locally and that this individual has 23 years of experience, you know, and started the clinic from scratch, you know, back in the day. Right. So they don't have that information. They only have this benchmark to go off of to say, is this worth looking into? And like I said, it is a pain if they come and start auditing you and wanting to look into this, because guess what? They're going to look at the Medicare claims and the compensation arrangements for the entirety of the agreement. So when I go back to those Michigan hospitals, they were looked at from 2006 to 2016 which means those hospitals had to provide all the data from 2006 to 2016. You know, if you have it in function, raise your hand if you've gone through an EHR conversion since then. How easy would it be able to, if you have a provider at your hospital that's been there for 20 years, can you pull all the data for that amount of time? Probably not. Are they going to make you? Probably. So it's a huge hurdle. It's a big pain in the butt. You don't want to be in this position. So getting up to all of that, let me talk to you a little bit about Black River Memorial Hospital and this guy, Carl Selvick, who's on here with me. So Carl and I had actually known each other from um, a previous organization, and he came in as CEO and wanted to adopt a new compensation share. He's like, I need to make things streamlined. You know, I, you know, people are all paid differently. We need to make sure we have compensation that aligns with our organization, that has, you know, it meets our operational goals. I need to be able to make sure people are paid accurately and fairly. We were also, they were also looking to start employing some CRNA. So, hey, it's a great way to start from scratch and know we have something that that works. We also, they, he knew that they needed to be competitive. They wanted to fairly compensate providers, make sure we took into consideration what was important for the providers, that we wanted to reward high um, high performers, we knew they have a very, they have a lovely benefits package. I think I asked them for a job at one point. Um, and so we want to make sure that the total cost is something that is financially feasible, but also realistic. Um, and we want to make sure we're in compliance with things and following industry best practices. And then we end up having really good um, contract templates. So we took them through a process. We did a bunch of data collection and analysis. We put together a leadership team to divide through, to lead through this, it included providers and administration. We did a lot of education with the providers. We interviewed them and found out what was important to them. You know, we took all that, we did more data review and analysis, and we put together basically a straw man and said, here's an idea. And we put it in front of the providers and they didn't like it. And they made edits, which was fantastic because then we ended up with overall a compensation strategy that worked for the organization and it worked for the providers. So that's just a high level of what we did together. And now I'm really looking forward to being able to talk with Carl with you guys and he and have it from his perspective of, you know, how he will be able to lead through because they do say for a rural hospital CEO, and actually I think it's for any CEO um, in healthcare. The three scariest things you can do is new build, provider compensation, EH, change your EHR, right? And I think Carl's like, how am I going to get as many of these done in my career as possible and um, to, to maximize my stress levels? So with that, I would like to introduce all of you to Mr. Carl Selvick. Um, a little bit about Carl, which I'm going to ask him to talk about his background, but I have to say he is a unique individual. He came out into healthcare by way of being a pharmacist, right? And decided, that, okay, that's not enough to be just a pharmacist. He was going to go ahead and also have his MBA. Do his, he's done the executive program through ACHE um, and has done a lot of leadership training. And oh, by the way, he's only like 36 years old. So he's one of those um, rock stars in rural healthcare that has managed to, you know, by the way of his leadership and the skills that he has demonstrated, has been able to risen up and has really been doing a wonderful turnaround with this hospital that in the years that I have been working with them have has seen has seen him take this hospital really turn it around get them in the black for the first time in years and doing that all while leading through a very significant provider compensation change so with that welcome Carl thank you so much for joining me today um, we're really excited to have you um, join us for this critical access hospital virtual conference this year 
Yeah, thank you for uh, having me today. Uh, I hope I am half the leader that you just described me as. So that sounds amazing. Wow, thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, why don't we go ahead, since you and I have known each other for years, why don't you, from your words then, talk to us a little bit about, about your background and how you got to working, you were a pharmacist, and then you ended up working with physicians and um, advanced practice providers. Yeah, and so- in this first position. Um, so I graduated from UW Madison. Um, if you guys haven't watched uh, the news, we're just listed as new IV. It's not really a thing. Um, I think it's an article that we posted out and I think we're trying to make it a thing. So anyways, I'm, uh, I graduated from a new IV league school is what all our UW grads are now saying. So that was a, a funny article that was posted this week. So part of our training in pharmacy school, and I just mentioned like working with physicians, I've been formally trained on it. Like that's how we're trained as pharmacy. We uh, are evidence-based. We can get nothing done except through providers. So we have to be able to like communicate articulately, have to be able to demonstrate the value to the patients with the evidence supporting it. So we actually have formal training um, in our program on how to work with providers. So that's something that has really come naturally to me and and part of my background. So, um, you know, when I graduated, I, I worked at an independent pharmacy in, in Green Bay, Wisconsin um, in my 20s and then um, led through a turnaround, started a new business uh, there, and it was really, really successful. Uh, and so at, at that point, I had a mid-career crisis, I say. Uh, so they offered me to become an owner and then go along a CEO succession path. Um, and while that would have been an awesome job for me, it wasn't the right fit for my family. Uh, so moved on um, to wanting to be a healthcare administrator. So all of those items that, that I did there, um, saw starting a new business line, I just, I didn't have words for what we did. I just know I wanted to do more of it. And I would learn those words in my career from some of my training, um, the population health, health equity, like building new services. Uh, but I, I've been working with physicians I would say almost my entirety of my administrative career. So I was really lucky to work for an organization with longevity and with longevity uh, comes if they all start at the same time, uh, everyone retiring at the same time. So um, the administrators were retiring um, and I was able to take on a lot of other duties as assigned. One of them was for the uh, employed medical group of 90 plus physicians and uh, a really great opportunity in that we had really invested in population health and we wanted to start taking on risk. So uh, I led that group um, as the dyad, so the administrator with a physician through um, value-based readiness, starting an accountable care organization, taking on upsided risk. And right before we left, we uh, took on dual-sided risk and uh, um, maximized the amount of risk we could take on with Medicare. So each year we were able to get um, positive value coming out from those arrangements. Awesome. And actually, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and stop my share so you guys can actually see yeah. Carl from a, a larger instead of his picture. You can actually, everybody can see Carl a little bit better. Um, so then what brought you to Black River? Like you were at this large organization and you said, I'm going to go to a critical access hospital in rural Wisconsin. Um. So the short answer, family. Uh, so the, my wife, uh, her uh, family are cranberry growers. And so uh, I went on an executive search to get closer to family. We work a lot. Uh, so she's a pharmacist. We met in pharmacy school. Uh, it's really hard to get home. So we had two young kids. And, um, you know, my wife talks to her mom every single day. And to getting closer to home is about four or five hour drive. So that was a dissatisfier for us. Um Two, I wanted to take on bigger and larger things. And so um, while it's a smaller organization, a larger role in a smaller organization. So um, I've worked for independent organizations my whole career. I only wanted to work for independent. So when we went on the search, uh, I let my wife know there are exactly two independent hospitals within that search criteria that she had set out for us. Um, and I said the likelihood that I'm going to get one of them was really, really low. Uh, so um, both of them um, opened up around the same time, and I got one of the positions. So just really lucky to do that. Um, and, and the other reason why I wanted to come here um, specifically was um, our county health rankings and the ability to make an impact. So we in 2022, when I came here, we're ranked 71 out of 72 for county uh, health rankings. So we are sick. Our ALICE score, Asset Limited Income constrained and employed is 40%. 40% of the population lives underneath the threshold of financial survivability. What an impact that we can make in the community 
over a lifetime of my career. So that's why I started in pharmacy and wanted to go administration. So those items didn't scare me. They looked at like real opportunities to um, make a large career. So the organization being very community focused was a, a motivator for me. Awesome. And so, I mean, I gave a little bit of background about the engagement, but talk about, you know, why, like you, you had just been at the organization, maybe about a month, maybe, maybe yeah. 60 days when you gave, gave me a, a phone call. Yeah. So what prompted do you say we should look at provider compensation? So, I mean, one, we, we, I had worked with you before in my career and even on the engagements that we didn't work with, it was really funny because our CFO was like, you know, we should probably use straw water. They're like, they're better and they're, they're more affordable than these other organizations. And then we'd like to use another organization. And I was like, you know, you're the one that signs the, the bills of these. So um, I was like, we can absolutely use straw water on any of these engagements. So um, knowing that and the recommendation um, and the items that you've done, um, I knew that I wanted to work with you guys specifically. So that's why we, I reached out to you, but in the first 60 days, um, um, really went back to my interview. Um, so the few items that I was asked to do and deliver on my interview. So provider compensation didn't just happen in a bubble. We had a lot of intersectional items that we had to do all at the same time. One was we had just approved a negative operating budget for the first time in the organization's history. So uh, we had to get out of that. Um, we did not have a strategic plan to come out of COVID to financial independence. So we are independent. We want to remain independent. And we want to remain independent for our community because we believe we can we will care more about our community than anyone else will. So that was number one. Two uh, was culture uh, of the organization. Um, we came in my interview of, of wanting to get back to uh, like a patient experience-based culture. Uh, they used like the Studer group culture. And then we had drifted from that. Um, and so that was two. And then the third uh, was uh, our employee engagement score for providers was critically low. So I was asked to improve that, not just employed, but in medical staff. So all of those items were in my interview. Um, and so in the, I, I made a plan, you know, if you read the book, like what to do in your first 90 days, I read it and then I did the exact opposite of that. Um, and so um, you got to know the rules to break the rules. So I, um, um, you're not supposed to do any changes in the first 90 days. That was just not a reality for us. Uh, so I, I made, um, the in intent to round with every single provider and every single employee in the first 90 days. So in the first 60 days, I, I front loaded a lot of the providers hearing really consistently. We're paid in market competitive rates. We know that because we compare salaries across the market of our colleagues and all that. So perfect. The problem is we don't understand how we're paid. We don't understand our contracts. We don't like the annual process. And so then from there, I started asking questions. How do you do this? And while there's nothing wrong with how we did it, it wasn't best practice. It didn't align providers. It should be simple. They should understand it. We shouldn't be setting rates and we weren't, but we weren't using like benchmarks that were explained to providers and how we set the rates. We were setting the rates and then telling them. So all of those items were concerns. And then looking at a strategic plan of financial survivability, we needed to move the organization from inpatient COVID focused to outpatient community focused. So we had the right providers, uh, but we just weren't doing the things that the community needed. So all of that was discovered in the first 60 days. Um, and looking at the items that we needed to do uh, and our leadership, I was the most trained on um, provider compensation. That was like my whole job before, but that's not appropriate for me to do as a CEO. So I wanted to partner with someone that would help develop and train our leaders. Uh, and so that was the original engagement. Hey, work with us on this and the providers, um, help them get a compensation that allows us to be nimble and flexible for our community uh, so that they can understand it. And can you train our administrators to take it from there? And so that, that was the original engagement that we brought you in on. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember one of the things that you got was very, very unique about your organization is our initial analysis showed that you actually had more providers, at least in different departments, than you needed because you guys were actually very, very weird. Yeah. And you were able to staff up during the pandemic. You were able to actually get providers into your community. So I realize everybody else on this call will probably want to know how the heck you guys did that because everybody else is having difficulty recruiting providers. 
talk to me a little bit about how you went about like when we looked at the volumes and we said you have more providers than you need you to made the decision to well i'm not going to get rid of anybody Ta um talk like talk to us a little bit about that decision how and you know what you ended up doing operationally with more providers than you needed yeah so like looking back um i took over right in the year that covid volume fell off uh the and also the pandemic funds were gone so all of that was at the same time which is why our our negative volume was there so we were staffed for the pandemic really successfully to be able to get people in uh, meet their needs we had higher acuity right you couldn't transfer anyone out so you have to be able to like hold your own here so uh, we had a really good model for the pandemic coming out of the pandemic we didn't create a responsive model out of it so uh, that was just where I, I was at in the time that i took over as ceo to build that so um um that was the background and then what was the question again oh well what you ended up doing with that staff because you said i'm not getting rid of anybody and so you have a culture you have a very specific philosophy with regards to people in your organization so in the first like 90 days, um, because we were having an additive operating margin and uh, I needed to create a culture of psychological safety, like getting out of this, we were going to get out of it. I think in the first two weeks, I I went to our leadership team and, and let them know that um, uh, we were going to have a whole lot of work ahead of us. Um, that, uh, this might not align for everyone, but we're not going to balance the books through layoffs, furloughs, or any service line closures, because that is lazy leadership. And I don't believe in it. Uh, so this is the second financial turnaround that I've been in. I've never laid off anyone in my entire career due to financial reasons alone. And I have a personal commitment to not do that until I retire. So that's well of me to say, but I personally went to organizations where I get to control that. Now, that's the like moral and, and stance, and it, it's great to stand on uh, moral high ground. But what's the business case? The business doesn't support it either. So all the evidence from Fortune 500 companies of how people led through financial turnarounds is if you, if you lead through areas that don't align with your staff, through layoffs, through cuts, through all those other items, you will have short-term gains at long-term expense. So your performance over the long-term will go down. So the business doesn't support that as well. So I uh, went to the board of directors and, and said, you know, this is going to get worse before it gets better. We do have a plan. And that was really nice that we, we had a, a consultant group that we were working with um, for our auditors. And, and they, what I asked coming in is that I want them prepped and I want a plan to deliver um, when I get there. And they did. So they delivered on that. Carl, here's the plan. Added it all up. No, we're going to be able to get through this. We're going to be just fine. However, the numbers are going to look really, really bad for a period of time. And that's going to scare people. So we, we can't get out of that without people. We're in the business of people. We're in the service industry. We need our people to get through it. And our community is sick. We we are a limited resource. We need all of these providers to make the impact long term. So uh, one, I said we are not going to lay anyone off. And that meant providers as well. So, yep, you're not working in the right areas. We don't need you in um, for COVID. That's gone. We don't have that same inpatient volume. Guess what? We need to switch to outpatient and, and change up our model. And so bringing you in and helping us see that of what are the different areas that we can do to give back to our community and at the same time, we were going through like a community health needs assessment. So all of that was interlaid together and we we're able to see, here's the needs that our community is asking for us. So we have more than enough work for everyone. Yeah. I mean, you decided to launch some new things, including, um, you know, wound care, pain, exp like you were starting to look at um, what are services you could add and who has the experience to be participating in that. I believe, uh, didn't we have some, one of the hospitalist uh, nurse practitioners become a wound care specialist? Yeah, and I just rounded with her today. And so one of the operational models that we did, um, I was like, hey, how's it going? Because we're it, it's, um, it has to flex between both units. And it's the first time that's been tested. So our volume is really, really high again in the summer because uh, we're a vacation town. And uh, uh, rounding with our medical director, and he's like, it's, it's not going great. Like we're learning, but it's working. I was like, okay, perfect. So yeah, we we trained them up. We sent them 
um, to the area. And, and really with this provider, it was really awesome. Uh, the, the, I, I think her words were, you know, I'm just going to go into this uh, with a positive attitude. I'm, I'm going to go all in and, and try to learn this. Um, and, you know, I'm fully committed to it. So a brand new service line. Didn't know anything about it. Um, we did use um, a company, Heal Logics. They're they're national to provide that training. So, not just in providers, but in leadership and in our staff. Part of our turnaround philosophy was, um, we will give you the tools that you need. There is no budget for that. Um, so when we should have been cutting expenses, I was adding on expenses. We brought you on to help support our providers, um, and you're not free. And we spent a lot on education and coaching to retrain and retool our staff that if you're committed to this community, you have a job here, it just may be different. And we will give you the training you need to do that job. Well, you created a brand new position in Nicole, right? right. You guys never had anybody who was actually head of you know the providers. And what is Nicole's official role now? Cause she'd been with the organization for, I wanna say 17 plus years. 20 now you 28, oh. it's 28, oh. but she doesn't actually want me to use how many years it is. She's at that point in her career. She's like, just say 20 plus years. So sorry, uh, cut that out, yes. edit it 20 plus years um, at this organization. Um, but so our uh, our medical staff engagement scores were really, really low. Um, and so I knew that we needed someone focused on providers being there, helping them lead through this, we needed to add on three or four specialties for this community that was leaving the community. Like there are 50 mile um, commutes to get this service. That's not okay for wound care, especially wound care when you, it's like sometimes three days a week, 50 miles there, 50 miles back. These are dual employed families. They can't, they'll just avoid that wound care. And then it's an amputation. So um, added on Nicole to a brand new role. Um, and really, we promoted her for one reason. Uh, she was good. That, that's it. Like, she was good. She didn't know anything about this role um, other than she had a really great relationship with providers. So as I rounded on medical staff, she was one of the rising stars in our organization. Um, in that um, we had low medical staff engagement. Um, a lot of our, like... Um, Medical staff and the hospital when I came in were like fighting with each other, um, and she was one of the leaders that had bridged those gaps. So that that's a skill set that I that I was like I want to bring that to administration. That's a skill set that we don't have on our team, and it's a really really important skill set. Um, unfortunately, uh, she didn't know that she was going to be going through provider engagement. I did explain it, but she didn't understand what that meant other than that sounds like really interesting. I'd love to take on the role. So she would learn what that meant. Um, but I was like, sorry, you already accepted the role. It's can't go back. So. Yeah. I think it like we were three months into the engagement and before we, when you started her role and we dropped her in and be like, by the way, what Carl meant was we're going to completely redesign compensation for providers. So you know how the providers have loved you? For years and years and years and that's part of how you got this role now you get to make everybody <laughs> um yeah. with with discussing potential changes so with that being said talking about the compensation redesign engagement what what do you in from your perspective what do you think was the most difficult thing we tackled um yeah that's a really hard question there was like i think for the organization um it was on the like the change management and how that felt in the organization. So uh, part of like changing our organizational culture um, to patient focused meant uh, that we had to give up like our own focus on ourselves and change like our needs to meet the needs of the community and build that as a culture. And, and that was really difficult, not, not just for providers, just across the organization, because we're changing really long standing service lines long-standing um, areas and how we practiced and changing them fast in order to be here, be independent and build these services that this community needs. So I, I think culture was, was difficult for us, but also um, was a reason why we were successful as well. Was that like that focus on the why we're doing things. And I, I think with staff, uh, not everyone followed us to the end of the journey, right? So a lot of people, um, they just wanted to do this one thing and they wanted to only do that one thing. And they want to do it at a larger volume than we had. So coming out of COVID, like they had a passion of just doing like hospital medicine, 
well, our hospital medicine volume tanked. Like, I don't want to be doing uh, two different service lines throughout the day. That that fair. So those people actually moved to a lot of, we were surrounded by academic medical centers to academic medical centers, pick up per diem here just for that service line. But we're still losing friends, right? You know, we just went through COVID together. We we, we went through this journey and moving on to the next step of their career. So that was, that was the hardest part, right? Of change, changing things and changing people and changing how we're, we're doing things and what that feels like. Yeah. Change management in particular takes a specific kind of kind of leadership, right? There's one thing to get through status quo. There's another thing to, to go through a whole like change overhaul um, to drive an organization. And in this case, a complete turnaround. Um, one of the things, so when we do provider compensation engagements, we will not do them, frankly, at Stroudwater from a top down of just, okay, I'm going to go into the back room with the CEO and CFO, and we're going to redesign something and we're going to present it and say, here, here's your new contract. Right. Because, and then I will say, um, I have done that in my career um, back in the day, and I don't think it works if you don't have the providers at the table, if they don't have some sort of say, if they don't have an, an at least some area where they can give input as to what motivates them, what will work for them, then, um, you know, it, it just, it you'll end up having staff turnover. Like those providers will leave if they don't have, if you did not include them in the conversation and it becomes just a top down, here's what MGMA said we can pay you and here's what you're going to get. And this is how I've structured it because this is what, you know, this is what I'm familiar with. Um, and so one of the things we had to put together was this provider compensation committee. And so, you know, one of the things we do, and I will say out of wor working with you, we've actually <laughs> developed a whole new tool um, with regards to helping identify, you know, who are the right provider leaders in, within an organization, what the good criteria is um, based off of our engagement with you. So talk to us a little bit how what you were looking for in trying to find who are the right leaders within the organization, you know, that need to be included at the table. Yeah. So it's the philosophy of like, can you um, provide input and put the needs of everyone else and the organization above your own? Like that's first and foremost, like that's from administration, from providers, from both, like that's what it means to be on a provider compensation committee. And so um, I did have experience in my last organization doing just that. Again, leading through value-based care, we each practice elected a member to be there. And very specifically, you are not here for yourself. You are here for your whole practice. You have to represent your practice. And guess what? You're going to have to go back to your practice and sell some of the things that we're talking about. This isn't me. This is us and the items that we're going through, and, and you're the one providing the inputs. But then, like, as the administrator, I brought on the, the background paperwork. Like, here's the contracts that we signed. Here, here's our strategic initiatives, and we need to find areas that um, reward you as we're successful. So um, first was being able to put the organization above the needs of um themselves, but then also um, just being committed, right? Being able, committed to meeting all the meetings. It's a whole lot of extra work. It's not fun. Like none of this is fun. No one wants to do this. So then like the other was like, hey, even if it's not great, like, are you just committed to seeing this through to the end? So I think the, those were the two big items. And uh, I mean, what would you add like of other items of best practices? Yeah, I mean, part of it was um, that open mindedness. I, I have to give credit to one person in particular, Dr. Carol Martin. She was just incredible as far as she had been at the organization, um, you know, for I want to say for 20 years, 20 plus years, was a local community member. You know, she definitely had her ideas, but she came into every meeting saying, I want to learn. I want to learn what is best practice and why that's best practice. And so that I can critically think as to, okay, how do we make that ours, right? And that open-mindedness as opposed to coming into a meeting with a preconceived notion, because I know we had to do, I mean, you guys didn't even have a, frankly, a provider, you didn't have much of a provider group before this, as far as any sort of, you didn't have provider exec, you didn't have med exec, you didn't have, this was the first time we actually, this, 
out of all the things that you can get a group of uh, say, you are now representing the providers of the organization. Very first thing you're going to tackle is compensation. Um, you know, you know, uh, that's, that's a very difficult thing to be the very first thing that any sort of provider leadership group is going to, to work on. So I know we had to do a bunch of training with providers about, at first there was a mindset of, I'm here to get the notes, to then pass the notes on, get their feedback and bring the notes back. Right. As opposed to like, I'm, I'm, I'm basically telephone, right. I get the message. I repeat it. I take that message from them and give you guys feedback as opposed to sitting in that leadership of, I need to wear a leadership hat. I need to actually come with ideas and opinions and I need to hear what, you know, my fellow providers think is right. And I need to distill it down to help me make informed decisions and bring that informed opinion that may not be what all the rest of my colleagues agree with, right? Because the um and that you know the first few meetings were a little bit bumpy. Of you know I remember um a couple of providers coming in with their notes of saying, okay, I've rounded on with all the clinic providers. So and so is said wants this. So and so wants that. Here's this note, et cetera. And I'm like, no, you're not. Like we're you're not a recorder. You're not, you're not that you need, we want, well, what do you think? And so Dr. Martin in particular, I have to say, she was really exemplary with, I'm going to come in and be completely open-minded. I'm going to go and make sure I give transparent communication back to everybody I'm talking to. I'm going to come in with having like my ideas organized, but I'm going to also still come in and listen. And so that way I can take the ideas that I've organized from meeting with my fellow providers and adjust it based off of whatever new information has come out. Yeah, um, that, was, so. that was definitely a lesson that we learned along the way and extended the engagement. Like you and I said like, hey, this is the timeline it'll normally take. And like we doubled it and that's okay. Like it's the time that it needs to take uh, to, to happen and be successful and perfect. So that's our investment in them was looking at how that went and not, I guess, not understanding where everyone else was from a leadership development perspective and like not um, honoring that and, and making it important. And so, you know, it's the stereotypical, like, well, anyone can be an administrator. What, what do you guys do? Well, it's actually a skill set, right? And and we forgot that along the way. And so, yeah, we caught it as things were going and then, okay, we needed to add in leadership development to even be successful and like help facilitate these meetings and um, so yeah, we added on like helping them, uh, and modeling and co- like all those areas that you teach leadership and, and adding in, um, Nicole to the meetings as they're presenting, like not to, all right, you're not the one presenting Nicole, but you're there to like support them and like, all right, can you clarify items in the moment so that we all get a consistent message across all the groups? So then we started adding Nicole as people went back, just go across each meeting to make sure everyone's getting a uniform message. So that that helped as we developed our leadership and and physician leadership. Yeah, that I mean, that was really awesome to, especially to see now Nicole being in a position where she can lead me. I mean, I'm I'm not even in attendance on a bunch of stuff now. And Nicole's just like, okay, here's how my, you know, my meeting went and everybody's signed off and we're good. And, you know, thanks for double checking my presentation before I went and did it. And, um, you know, and that she's going to be reporting to the board going forward. Um, so I would be, re- I can't, we can't have this kind of conversation without talking about data, right? Yeah. And because part of leadership is you measure what matters, you have to make sure, and also working with providers, you have to have data to back up what you're doing. And so talk to us a little bit about, you know, let's, I'm, I'm, I want to use the CRNAs as an example, because that was brand new of you had not employed CRNAs, you had always had contracted. Um, you know, we ran into some stuff with the data to be able to engage with the CRNAs. Talk a little bit about that and how you guys have adjusted since then. So specifically the CRNAs, one, brilliant people and came to us being like, Carl, this data is not right. Right. And then, and, and okay, okay. And didn't listen at the time. And it turned out like, yeah, the data is completely wrong. And so uh, our CRNAs were a 1099 group that came employed and just had a strong business sense. So, like, it was really interesting on, on like presenting data and all of that. Their level of understanding was quite different than the employed group because there were business owners on 1099 when they're looking at it had a higher level of understanding than we did and identified our data errors. So what was the role in data and coming to solutions? 
Well, uh, the role that it should have been, right, is to like inform us of where we're at, help us to be able to model out different compensation um, items that might work. Like, what are our ASA units? Okay, um, can we provide a bonus in ASA units? Uh, can we can we provide growing them? So we need to know where we're at um, as a group and have accurate to be able to like know what market competitive compensation can be for the level of work that we're asking them. Right. So that's just like the generic part of data that it should be there, and and the philosophy that I brought here, and I think you. Um, also use the same philosophy was that we can get um, financial information for providers wrong exactly zero times, exactly zero times, because they will lose trust on our ability to be paid on production or any other matter if the data that we're measuring and providing is wrong. And, and like their compensation is tied to it. It needs to be accurate. And unfortunately, I was on the receiving end it, in my career a few times where data was wrong and they were not happy. And we had to like rebuild trust uh, and put in validation items so that they would know that coming forward that their check was accurate. So I have to say one of the things that I actually, like, I agree, you can put wrong data in front of a uh, of provider zero times, right? You know. Um, although I love one of my colleagues who's um, on our clinical team says, and God, we trust all others bring data, right? Like you have to have data to back up what you're saying. You can't just say, we're going to go and do this. And I want to be like, why? What are the numbers that support like why you want to do this? And what I loved about the CRNA group in particular is we put data in front of them that was wrong. Yeah. And what happened was, yeah, okay. I was like, oh my goodness, we're going to have to completely rebuild. But the fact that we were able to work together to figure out why it was wrong, what was missing. And it was a collaborative process with them. Like they helped uncover what the issue was. And so now your billing team is better. Revenue yep. cycle at the hospital is actually is better, is more diligent. And now they have communication back and forth in order to make sure like the fact that now, like the whole, the fa <laughs> we're doing a compensation engagement and the entire revenue cycle team is better now as a result of they're, in, they're working with providers to make sure things are getting billed correctly and we're getting so that their data is correct, that they know their compensation is now tied to. But on top of that, the money's now coming into the hospital money. to yep. make sure, yeah, to be able to afford the compensation. But I mean, I never, I did not think at the beginning of the engagement that we were actually going to be impacting revenue cycle. And we had around a 15% growth in billable services in our OR. And a large part of it was one, we grew, right? So engaging all of them, we grew, engaging the medical staff. Yep, we had a return to these services in the community. B, uh, they were right. We were not billing correctly for, and we were leaving money on the table. Oh my gosh, we're doing all this work. Uh, it's all this great work and we're just not billing for it. So like that was a seven figure fine from our CRNA group. It's accurate now, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's definitely accurate now. I love. Um, I like getting the updated reports. And I will say, for those of you guys who are listening, that happens actually more than you would think. Like of realizing, and that's why I know that some providers push back of saying, especially if they they're part of a clinic, if they used to be independent, and they you know are like, I just I'm done with the business side of it. I just want to do inpatient care. I just want to provide patient care. I don't want to talk about finances anymore. I sold you my practice you run it now. And so sometimes, you know, those providers end up not wanting to engage about the finances and the, that data as much anymore. But I've got another organization here, here in Region D that we're talking to that they're realizing they are, there are so many services that they're providing that they're not billing for. And part of it is the providers are trying to make it really easy on the patients, which is great, but they're missing, like there's one step that's missing that then they would be able to bill for that service. So everybody in the clinic is working so hard to basically do every step of a visit, except for the one thing that they have to do to be able to, you know, get paid for it. And so that organization, you know, trying to go through of like, oh my goodness, if you talk with the providers and they realize that just this one incremental thing will make all these services actually all of a sudden be payable, you know, and here's the financial impact of that then we can count this and here's how much better the organization, this is why it's worth doing. So you have to engage with providers 
you know, you might get some resistance. Find some providers who are nerdy about numbers. Anesthesiologists always are, right? They're big numbers people. Um, and so, but finding those providers and having them help train the other providers um, and engage it. So it's not always administration um, going in because there was a lead CRNA who was more, oh. who's like, you know, we didn't meet with all the CRNAs every single time. We were able to identify here's, you know, here's a CRNA who's really passionate about this. But I will say, on the CRNAs also, they brought fresh data to the table. Forget how the billing is going. They're like, we want you to have more information about what's going on in the market from a compensation standpoint. Here's a bunch of, and they're like, we're, we're going to go and do our research and we're going to go and find some other stuff for you guys to look at. And we were able to identify that, frankly, MGMA, the data that we were using had not caught up with the market. There was for those of you who employ CRNAs or have worked with CRNAs, you might know there was this weird hiccup. There was like a good six month period where, like, especially where Carl's located in Wisconsin, but there were a few other states, but Wisconsin was definitely the worst, where there was a weird hiccup where CRNA compensation was was 20% off easily from, from the national data. Um, from MGMA, because one, surveys are always a year old, right? They're based on previous year. And there was some pandemic stuff that had impacted provider compensation significantly. So we were able, they were able to help us get, like, we'll pay more attention to some real-time data to make sure, you know, hey, we're aware of what was um, going on in the market. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit, Carl, and I want to talk to you a, bit, a little bit about your board. Okay. Um, and how you, how did you engage with the board? How, what was the appropriate role? Because provider compensation for most organizations, especially if they're government owned, right? If they're county owned or anything of that nature, provider compensation is usually very much a board level conversation, right? It's not a CEO doesn't have sole authority to go and just decide what compensation is going to be, et cetera. So talk to us a little bit about your board, what what is the composition of your board as far as how healthcare savvy, et cetera, they are, and you know how how did you were how did you work with them through this engagement, but also what is how do you as a leader, what is your relationship with like with your board and what do you do to cultivate that? Yeah, so I mean it evolved over time. I was a new leader um, going through this, and so we we implemented different strategies over time. So I'll just give several examples of, of what we did and show how it evolved. So, I mean, when we, when we first did it, um, it was explaining the why doing board education. So one of the items that we didn't regularly have that I'm used to is every time you're providing board education on a relevant topic to your organization so that the board over a period of 12 months has specific education on the services that you're providing and uh, without getting into operations knows more at the governance level. So as we're making decisions, so we started with board education, just on provider compensation. Why should you care? And it was more like compliance concerns because the compliance of provider compensation reports to the board, the operations of provider compensation doesn't. And so it was bringing that, Hey, we're going to be creating these moving from redoing contracts, creating compensation plans, like what are they? And they will need your approval as the board of directors. So like, why should you care about that? And why should you care about if it's done really, really well? Um, and what are the things that we're doing to protect the organization? Uh, because none of us look good in orange. And instead of making it our problem, we'll make it Opal and Strawwater's problem. And so that's money well spent. So anytime I can shift that to Opal and Strawwater, happy to do it. So to be uh, clear, you also had a legal team. You made a legal, legal, legal yeah, and, and legal just problem. Our problem. We yeah. know it's their problem, actually. So <laughs> we will require you to sign off on anything that we're doing. So, hey, if we miss a step, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll have these valuations before we bring anything to the provider level. So it's giving them that expectation and the timeline, keep, keep keeping them updated on the timeline. And then I, I meet monthly with my board chair. So we go we go pretty in depth on operations just so that, hey, you hear anything in the community or in the organization. I just, I wanna know about it. And I want you to know what we're working on this month, especially through a financial turnaround. So, um, we had about an hour's worth of conversation every month on the financial turnaround, all these items that we were asked to do, um, and provider compensation was one of them. So just wanting to make sure that we were well informed and the board chair was the, the best informed and could guide me on items that need to be brought up at the board level. So it was those conversations, does this need to be up at the board level? No. 
as we shifted along, um, we noticed that we had a better, we needed to do a better job of keeping them aligned with operations. So one of the items that we added on um, was um, just going into closed session. So going through your governance and then going in through closed session, uh, this having all the administrators leave, uh, not really having any action items and just having conversations. This is what's this is what's going on right now in the organization. These are things that I am personally struggling with or I'm worried about. Um, this is not governance. This should not be at a board. There's not an agenda item like, hey, what's on Carl's mind this month? You know, that that's not a board level discussion. Um, but that really, really worked. Uh, and so we've worked through this and we've actually kept that. So we really liked having that like 30 minute touch base of like, what are you guys hearing in the community? What are some of the things you're concerned about? There are regional closures and and then it's like, okay, what are you doing to respond? Are you going to close? And those, okay, I'll address it and I'll need to get something out. We're doing okay. Um, this is what I, you know, what I'm going to be posting. So even though we're through this engagement, we started with that engagement, um, but that's been really well received. And so we, 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 and every meeting going to close session and say, you know, what's going on? So kind of those items were how we kept the board involved. Um, but it was, um, it was added on over time based upon the board's needs. Now, and uh, um, remind me again, what is the composition of your board as far oh, as yeah. from a community standpoint and how healthcare savvy would you say? Because in rural, it's it's very different than, you know, yep. your for-profit boards or any of that. Yeah, so we have a nine community member board um, and one, sorry, eight community member board, one chief of staff. So uh, diversity wise, we do have, a retired medical director. Uh, so we have a large um, Ho Chunk population. Uh, who's a Ho Chunk Nation's um, uh, medical director, retired, serves on our board. So we do have two. We're lucky enough to have two physicians on our board, um, and then we've just brought onto the board a CFO uh, from uh, the Ho Chunk Department of Health as well. So we do have healthcare savvy people. Um, and that was one of the areas where as we were going through this, we had a few uh, people retire off of the board. We wanted to make sure that we we're adding on the specialties of finance, um, targeting more of the areas where we had struggles so that we could have governance over that and identify um, to us, really, if I'm missing anything, are we missing anything? Like the board should add value. Uh, they should be able to like look at those items and, and identify like, have you thought of this or what are you doing here? And if I don't have a good answer, well, you know, maybe I need to, right? So um, I, I would say 50% of the board um, has healthcare experience, 50% doesn't. Gotcha. Now, one of the things that we face in rural all the time is frankly, rural, it's a small community. The board member and the providers see each other at the grocery store every day. Um, you know, and yeah, you know, and at other town functions at the high school basketball game, um, not your board member, but apparently you do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with some of your providers, um, which I'm sure is very healthy <laughs> as far as if you ever have conflict that you guys can just go to the mat. And but, maybe um, I wouldn't uh, add in that I'd, I'd uh, bring on a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu mat as part of the contract. They requested it and they, they stuck it out like, Carl, you can't do that. I was like, okay, fine. So I, well, I, did, I did not know about that. That's funny. Um, but with providers, you know, it, it's very, when, when somebody knows you're on the board, we have this happen in rural communities all the time, where if a provider is not happy with the CEO, they're just going to go talk to the board member that they know, right? They're going to be like, and you know, so did you have any of that happen where somebody go when I, I actually genuinely don't know whether or not did anybody ever say, did you ever have a board member come up to you and say, Carl, you know, Carl, I hear you're cutting this provider's compensation or this provider's unhappy with you. Um, yeah, it, it did. Yeah. Uh, and that was something that I kind of took, that was, I came from a larger community and a lot larger organization. So like those items had never reached the board level and were always delegated to the CEO than it was delegated to me. Right. So really top down administration. If you have a concern, you're going straight to the CEO. Um, it, but that CEO had been there for 15 years. So again, I'm new here having to lead through a lot of these changes. And so uh, there was a lot of people going to like several of the board members instead of like coming to me to work through items and then just having to work through those um, like concerns of those people. Um, and um, so those closed sessions that we did really helped us work it out because we don't want, if someone's bringing like a confidential concern, 
don't bring it up around nine people right now that, that, that they brought you a confidential concern. Keep it confidential. You, yes, I know that our board meetings are confidential, but there's still like nine people and it's a small community. So let's let's have a one on one conversation to hear what's going on um, so that I can be able to address and move people through that. So like that was something that we had to do respectfully um, and um, you know, just ensure that like I'm available as a CEO for people to come to me. Now with, and I'll, this kind of gets to forget compensation for a while, um, getting to the larger overall turnaround that you were leading through, talk about a little bit, did, you know, how did you communicate with the community as to what was going on? Because in rural, our hospitals are the lifebloods of our community. We're, we're employing most of everybody in the community, right? Like one, usually one of the largest employers, um, you know, how is that? as far as keeping, you know, the community aware of what was going on? And did you just do it within the hospital or did you, did you ever engage with the larger community? How did you handle response from the community if they were concerned? No, it's definitely an area we could have done better. I'll just I'll point that out. Um, so, and it was an area of real difficulty because of the speed of change. So in the first six months of the job, we, uh, implemented and finalized 41 separate financial initiatives that led to a positive operating margin in that following year, leading to raises to all staff. There is no way to communicate out that level of speed and change, one, even within our organization, um, to let alone in the community. So um, that was a, an area where how do we get out to the community? Um, we redesigned an entire service line from the ground up. Um, and that was to like maximize critical access hospital reimbursement status, bring it back here. And like, how do we communicate that out into the community in a concise manner, explain what we're doing without alarming them um, that, oh my gosh, the hospital is going to close. So um, we utilized multiple strategies. And uh, so I'm a lifelong Rotary member. I've actually been volunteering for Rotary since I've been like 12. Um, I didn't actually know I was volunteering when I did it because I just, my dad made me. Um, and then I learned like, oh, this is, has a long history of, of um, volunteering and it's international. So I've, I've become a um a Rotary member ever since I graduated. Um, so just going out to those where like they're the key stakeholders, giving updates, letting, th these are the things that are going on. Just want to let you know, these are the reasons why things are going good. Um, but then like waiting till we had a story, right? So allowing these items to uh, financial changes and operational changes to snowball, to demonstrate with outcomes and facts. So I, I take a real principle of not addressing gossip or rumors. I, I just won't period. So if they want to come to me, I'll answer it, but I don't address gossip and rumors or those items just as a matter of principle. And so that might be not how you're supposed to lead in small towns, but it's just one of the areas that I do. Um, so I, if there are gossip and rumors, we have like a, um, I'll demonstrate with outcomes. So I, I'm not going to address that, but here's the outcomes that we've had, we've achieved. So, Hey, I heard the hospital's closing. Oh, throwing our financial statements aboard that shows they were operationally solvent. You know, I heard that the, the hospital has really, really bad quality scores. Posting on our Facebook and LinkedIn, encouraging people to see the like quality awards that we've won. So just doing those items. And then uh, this whole year, I've been doing community tours as well, letting them know um, all of the items that we've done, um, the outcomes that we've achieved, and really just thanking the community for their support, right? We're successful because they're coming to us for these services that were leaving town two years ago. No, that's awesome. And 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 to be, you know, a lot of people think, oh yeah, the community needs us and and being able to put that hat on no, like we need the community. Um and showing that kind of that that gratitude uh and making sure that they know it is is a big thing. So well, ta um, I know we're, we have only got about 17 minutes left. So what are the next steps that you're doing with regards to compensation moving forward? You have a, you have a streamlined comp plan across your different specialties. You know, are there other components in the pipeline of, you know, integrating things that you haven't done yet? Cause I know it's, it's usually a multi-year process. Yeah. So it was funny. Um, the CRNA engagement just came in there in the middle of it while we did this compensation engagement. So we paused it, added in CRNAs. 
created the whole comp plan, aligned them and said, here's the next steps. So uh, now that's coming due uh, for those next steps. Hey, where are those next steps? So we've grown like 15%. Um, and so now it's adding in like aligning them with the success of the surgical practice. We're successful because of what they do and helping them be rewarded in that. So um, the next steps for us is like, how can we provide like a baseline level of compensation for some of our like surgical specialties, but then align them with our strategic plan. And if we're more successful, allow them to be more successful. So sp specifically because of our market and region, um, I'm not looking at dual side risk, upside only. Uh, for providers, here's the baseline compensation just for showing up to work. Um, that's just what will work well in a region that's different from where I came from, and that's okay. Um, but then still giving that upside level opportunity. So for the other uh, providers, I, I think in the next couple of years, so we've we're uh, we've tied some level of compensation to community benefit. So we have this place marker uh, of additional compensation you can earn that's related to community benefit. Uh, we have a goal of being a five-star rated CMS hospital in the next three years. So we want to start putting in quality metrics that align with the hospital's goal um, within those areas, uh, put some of it for community benefit, but then transition in quality metrics that are publicly reported that we need the providers to be successful in. And, and quite honestly, one of the metrics that um, could be built in there today is readmissions. So we had a big readmission project um, aligned with them. We ended last year at top 10% for the nation based upon CMS's reporting structure. We weren't even in benchmark when we started that journey. So um, we have really engaged providers. They should be paid for getting those results. So they got us all those results because our compensation structure didn't allow them to reward from it. They didn't get an extra bonus. So they should, right? Yeah. Hey, I'm all about compensation is what you pay people to do what you need them to do. Oh, look, your providers did exactly what you needed them to do. How are you going to reward them for that? Yeah. So I think that's the next step. We're still missing out on a few of those other items. We have this success, but it's not built into our compensation plans because they're lagging. They're, they're coming, right? They're coming along everything in, in good time, but you know, their success is in their heart. And right. So we have providers that are here for the community and those reasons. Great. We're highly engaged. Now we want to pay them and reward them for our success to say thank you. So it's not enough just to say thank you or provide free food as one of the uh, benefits, which was like, the, I was like, this is your top benefit. This costs me $400. What about long-term disability? You know how hard it is to get this plan? Don't care about that. Free food, love it. So yes, we provide free food, but I would like to provide monetary compensation for top quality performance as, as a thank you. I will say, so part, I'm, I'm laughing in the background because that was a first for me. I've been, I've been doing provider compensation now for nearly 15 years. And that was the first time that it came out as one of like, I've heard childcare, right? Yeah. Especially like post pandemic, people are like, I need, I need child. Like when I say, what is the most important thing? Flexible work lot, you know, flexible staffing and all that such, you know, when can I, um, can I'd rather do four tens, you know, and, um, for an APP rather than five eights, you know, like, how can you arrange those kinds of things? Your organization was the very first one that it was literally in the top three things most important to the providers was people saying anybody who is a clinician, like, a, you know, the clinicians, because we, you know, it was before I think physicians all got meals at the hospital. But I mean, everything down to like LCSWs were like, we all want food <laughs> and top three, top three most important benefits. We all want food. Um, so and that was, that was we, the first for me. As we interview, I tell that story and joke and everyone that interviews is like, no, that's really important. They're like, do I get that if I come there? Yeah, you, you get it. It's, it's like $200 a year. Yeah. It's going to stay. I promise. Yeah. So, we're not touching yeah. that one. So last question, because I want to be mindful of time. What advice would you give to another organization that is concerned, you know, that their compensation is not aligned with or, with their goals? Like how, how another CEO calls you up and says, I, I'm thinking about going through this. What do you tell them? Yeah, I just um, so a few mistakes that I've done in my career is um, not do this with a partner firm. So one, 
you can do it with whoever you want, but I do recommend um, because the rules are getting really complex. Um, so at my last organization, and they said, no, Carl, you're really good at this. Do it yourself. Well, I actually missed one item, re a really, really small item. Um, and um, it was six weeks before I came here that it was coming up for renew and like, hey, this exhibit on compensation is coming. And uh, I messed it up. Um, so I had to fix it. After I'd give notice, I was like, I am not leaving with this messed up with, with these providers and fix it. Um, and it was a whole like running to fix my like translational error on this comp plan um, so that this provider can get awarded. I am I feel like I'm pretty good at this uh, and have a lot of experience. And because we like cheaped out, I'm like, what was it going to be like five grand? Uh, like to, to, to like write this out and build it. Like, no, Carl, you can do it. I made the former recommendation to the, to the CEO. I was like, okay, I'm leaving. I fixed it. Don't ever cut money on this again, no matter how good they are. Always pay someone to double check and lead us through that, even if we think that we can do that. So, I mean, I think that's my advice because this is complicated. The other advice is like, don't come in with um, like... I'm going through this right now and you actually caught me. And I was like, oh, and I, I didn't want to give you a compliment because I didn't want to give you a big head. Um, but like I had skipped, again, I skipped a step and I was coming in with like, this is how you do compensation. And you were like, well, I, you know, I, I, I know that we've done it before, but I, I think the first step is again, interviewing them, seeing what they value and then making sure that like you're aligning with this. And like, well, here's best practices. This, these are these are the options that they can pick from. I skipped the whole step of like interviewing providers. Again, I'm pretty good at this, but then like skipping that step and, and hearing you check that, I mean, that's value added. And I left the meeting just like hitting myself. I was like, that's basic, basic comp level items. But if you don't have you know, someone that does this every single day, helping you with it, and you miss those items, it's not like you'll break the law, but you won't have as great a success as you could. Well, and I promise you guys, I did not, two things, I did not pay Carl to say that, and two, uh, two if for those of you who know Eric Shell, Eric Shell is not the one who taught Carl Selvig to ha have an abundance mindset of we're not going to have layoffs. We're not going to do this. We're going to grow. And that's how we're going to get out of this financial turnaround is we're going to grow. Because some of you who have worked with uh, our chairman, Eric Shell, might think that 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 was Eric basically has a little earpiece into Carl's um, ear to say that. But that is not. It's just something that we have seen, though, that our most successful CEOs with a lot of these rural hospitals definitely have that abundance mindset and are now some of the most successful critical access hospitals in the country. So that being said, I want to make sure I've got, we've got just a few minutes left. Does anybody from the audience have any questions? Chat. Analyst Q&A. Oh, question for you, Carl. Yeah. What's next? How long uh, are are you staying there, or what does your career look like? Given given that I think Opal said you were young. Yeah. Um. So my wife said I could move exactly one more time, uh, and I used that for this job. Um. So I, uh, if I want to move and take on a different job, I'd have to do it without my wife, and uh, so you know I don't think it's worth it. So uh, unfortunately. Um, or fortunately for me, I did pick right and and, and we're, we're stuck in this community um, long term and my kids really seem to enjoy it, good schools and I, uh, I don't really know what they're learning because I ask them like, hey, do, do, do you like the school that you're in? And they're like, I love it. Well, what's your favorite part? Well, we get to trade Pokemon cards every day. <laughs> Are you bringing Pokemon cards to school? Yeah. The teacher sent an email saying kids shouldn't do that. I was like, you're the one doing it. So um no, yeah, no, I don't. I'm not going anywhere. This is um, it's a it's a blessing to be here in this community. Awesome. All right. Another question we have is: Do you share provider compensation with other providers? If so, did you have any fallout from disclosing the information? Um. So one of my colleagues, uh, you can do it both ways. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, I'll use it. Uh, Mike Sanders, uh, from if anyone's from Wisconsin region, a retired CEO, um. He, he led through provider compensation design. He was one of the people that I kind of like interviewed, like, how did you do it? Um, and he did share. And he was like, you know, it was real interesting when we shared. There's a lot of finger pointing, like, well, look at how much that person's making and look how much they're making. 
And he's like, so we, no, we had to work through that. Yep. Cause nope, we're going to uh, unveil it. We're going to have transparent compensation plan. You're going to get to see how everyone's uh, making. And some people had sweetheart deals and then we're going to come back and fix it. So uh, you can, but just understand like one, you want to make sure that you don't have any compliance concerns that you're unveiling to everyone. A, if you share provider compensation with others. Two, um, he used that as a way to like show them why we wanted uniform provider compensation and to be transparent because people before him were able to negotiate their own deal. And well, that's not fair. It is, and it isn't fair. You're right. Um, but th th that was a dramatic way of leading through it. Uh, so we didn't share provider compensation with others because it just doesn't feel good. Um, I, I'm... Uh, but we were transparent on how everyone would be paid and um, creating a transparent comp plan where everyone had the, uh, the, the same ability to influence their, their pay. Uh, so then we met with them individually, applied that comp plan. This is what you make now. This is what you'll make under the comp plan. A whole lot harder to do. Um, that way we had to meet individually with every single provider. I think it's better that way. Um, it's more respectful of those employees. Even if they're making the same amount of money, it doesn't feel good to have uh, an NP or a PA and just see, hey, this person's making a different amount of money over here for this specialty. And well, I, and maybe I should have taken a career there. So th that's how I've done it. I have had colleagues do it the other way. Opal, I'll turn to you. What's your recommendation? Um, So I'm one of those people that it's there, I also putting on an HR hat and it kind of depends on the employment laws within your state as far as making sure um, like what you actually share on an, on, I, I oftentimes when I do provider education to kind of show them, I will blind the provider's names. Everybody's compensation is out there where they can see here's base, here's productivity, like whatever the buckets are, but then the provider's names are blinded in any sort of education so that people can see. And honestly, if for me, especially if there's any compliance concerns, that goes to the board first and foremost. And to like to me, that's a good check of, hey, is our compensation okay? Is if you put in front of the board, here's all the providers, here's their FTE status, here is their specialty of what they do, and here's what they're paid. And the board, like everybody across the board, there's no question, like, are there any questions raised about pay equity of like, wait a minute, these two providers are the same specialty, same FTE status, and they're paid greatly differently, right? To me, if there's a huge difference there, that is a question of, okay, why is that? Do we have an official policy about tenure and this person's been here for 20 years and this person just joined? No, we don't. Then then why is there, you know, like, is what is the reason for that? Because I did actually work with a hospital, I want to say in Louisiana back in 2020, that had an issue where there was a female provider, same, you know, same, she was actually one of their rock star primary care providers, saw some of the most patients in the rural health clinic and they recruited a new male physician. And that guy was making like 70,000 more than her in base compensation. And it's like, okay, hey, that, that raises a red flag. And so that sometimes can be a good tool to say, are we okay? Can we explain the variances? Because if you're not comfortable with the variances, you might not have the right plan. So again, blinding it for when you're doing provider education. But then as Carl said, if you end up with a comp plan or a comp strategy that is very fair and equitable and is very out there in the open as to what the comp plan is and everybody can understand how everybody gets paid, then that transparency can be a lot easier to do, right? Because you want to know why they're different? Look at the comp plan. It's it, The comp plan rewards this and they're doing that. So then, yeah, great question. Um, Cause transparency, I'm a big advocate, but it can be very, very tricky. So, um, well, I'm, hold on. I've got, I, I don't want to get in trouble with Hillary here to make sure I got to share this slides. Cause I know we are about at time. So I want to thank everybody for attending today's conference. Um, you know, day two of, for this region, we do want to make sure, please, please, please. When I close this window, you are going to get um, a survey for this fourth annual Critical Access Hospital Regional Conference. As a reminder, you're going to get the recordings. You're going to get it. Um, it's actually will be out on our website. You'll be able to click on the different regions and see what the topics were at each at um, at each region um, and to be able to get the material that you need. 
but please use the survey function because again, that is how we plan next year's conference. It is how we plan to touch base with you. I'm sure um, I have Carl's information for anybody who wants to follow up with him. And um, thank uh, Carl, again, thank you so much for joining me today and doing this presentation and sharing your experiences because it's not an easy thing. This is, it's that was such a difficult thing to lead through. And it's, most people don't wanna get up front and say, yeah, I had to go and lead through something that, that difficult. Um, but at least you're out on the other end of it and have a very successful con uh, organization that has your back and actually appreciates what you've done. Because there were some points where I was like, hey, this guy might get kicked out because he's making everybody mad <laughs> um, with trying to do so many initiatives um, at once. Oh, wait, one more thing. Passed. Yeah. So again, thank you everyone for joining us and um, look forward to any other questions you have. We'll make sure we get those via email. So thanks again.